in presentation mastery connect with storytelling. The title is, is Let Me Tell You a Story. Thank you. Thank you. Let me tell you a story. September 1989. I finished this huge project in Munich, Germany, automating a factory for an unnamed big auto company. I win the President's Club. They say, go to Africa, have a great time. So I literally get on first class, BA, all the way to South Africa. I spend five days walking through the bush with the Kalahari Bushmen. Then I go on this incredibly luxurious safari. I'm living large. I fly home to San Francisco. That wasn't the story. I'm in San Francisco. It's early October. A huge earthquake, the Loma Prieta earthquake, occurs. My house settles eight inches and has huge X cracks in it. Oh. The neighborhood downhill from me collapses completely. Wow. The power is out. Gas flaming out of the streets where the gas lines have broken. I spend the next five days helping people evacuate their now crushed buildings because they're all condemned. No phone. In order to call my mom and tell her and everyone else that I'm not dead because everything on the TV looks like you're dead, I have to ride my motorcycle over the hill into South San Francisco where the phones still work. My boss says, don't worry, stay home. The building didn't fall down. That's all that's important. <laughs> so I'm literally working pretty much as a Red Cross volunteer for five days. The phone rings. It's the guy I work for in Europe. You've got to be here. Get on a plane. I'm like, are you aware that like this is a huge disaster? <laughs> the airport is closed. Like that's not happening. He's like, you've got to get on a plane. You've got to get here. A big problem. So fine. Get on an airplane. Fly back to Europe. That's not the story. I'm in Munich. What's supposed to be a big problem isn't that big a problem. We fix it. Then they say, now fly to the coast of the southern coast of Spain, Costa del Sol, and give this speech because the guy quit. And you gave the speech before, so you get to give the speech again. I fly there. I fly back. I go with this buddy of mine that's a programmer working on this project I'm on. He's a nice Brit. And we're listening to BBC, and we're, like, talking about this. And Germany is in turmoil. There are about half a million Germans standing in quiet, peaceful protest in what is then East Berlin. The government issues very strange communications. They seem confused. They seem sort of dazed. And when you're a central command authority and you're dazed, not good. Half a million people join peacefully. So we're in Munich working away. And I go, let's take the overnight train and let's go to Berlin. Because those are the kinds of good ideas I come up with. <laughs> So in those days, literally, guards came into the train. They inspected your passport. They love to kick the bed that you're sleeping in to make sure that you're really uncomfortable and wake up. None of that occurs. We cross into East Germany. Nobody gets on the train. Nobody tells us what to do. Nobody even checks our passport. I'm now in East Germany. I go into East Berlin. I'm there, it's November 7th, bright and early in the morning, you come staggering out of the train station, still looks like it's World War II, basically, come out, and the Berlin Wall falls. <coughs> Checkpoint Charlie is thrown open by the border guards. An estimated one million people cross over from East Germany into West Germany. Now. You have to imagine the Berlin Wall. It's 30 feet high, solid concrete, two more rows of barbed wire and fence. 
They've killed between seven and 10,000 people with machine guns and landmines to keep them from crossing this wall. Checkpoint Charlie is four layers of security. And when you go through each of those four guards, checks your passport, looks at you, where's your visa? Where are your German Deutsche Marks? Because you can't spend anything but East German money in East Germany. All that collapses and is blown away. But it's peaceful. It's a party. You never saw so many happy people. At one point, I actually was sitting on top of the wall. At another point, I smashed it over and over again with a sledgehammer and got little chunks of graffiti covered. You had to be on the west side to get the graffiti, the good stuff. Very poor construction quality, I will say. It collapses. About 5 million East Germans cross into West Germany just to see. The German government gives everybody who visits 100 Deutschmarks their welcome tag, their welcome gift. 100 Deutschmarks, meh, you're not buying a BMW, but you know, this is pretty amazing for these people. What do you think they spent the money on? Anybody want to guess what was the number one product that they beer. bought? Beer. beer! Lots of beer in East Germany. It wasn't, it wasn't bad beer in East Germany, and it was cheap. Good guess. But this was the number one product that they spent their, not this particular banana, I want to make that clear, <laughs> but they spent their money on an exotic fruit called the banana and wiped out Europe's supply of banana over the next three or four months. This is the dark time. We look around the world and we see scary things going on. We see governments suppressing their people. Nobody was better at this than the Soviet Union and its East German allies. Really good at putting the boot on people. However, half a million people peacefully protesting and leaning against that wall brought it down. When you see the banana, think about freedom and how lucky you are to have it. Thank you.